Hi, good evening, everyone. So thank you for all coming here tonight. Uh, my name is Saiko Kobayashi from Atreko Architects Office. So today we are so happy to welcome Fala Atelier, uh, Philip Magalinch, yes, and Anna Luisa Suarez, yes, and uh, Ahmed Belhoju, yes. And I'm sorry, Lisa Samvich, is it okay? Samvich is absent, and uh, I heard she's uh, taking uh, maternity leave, yes. So Fala was founded in 2013, and they are based in Porto, and have taught at uh, architecture facilities in Toronto, Venice, Milano, and London, and among others. And Fala's work has been widely published in digital and printed media, including 2G, volume 80. Maybe everybody knows this one, yeah? And let me explain a little bit about uh, our meeting. And, uh, we get our uh, emails from Ahmed last year, and uh, they had a research studio in Toronto University looking at around 250 Japanese houses of the 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, and uh, ranging from the famous to the very obscure. So, yes, this is a studio book. Yes, it's basic, and it's a copy of Japanese houses. So fortunately, we were invited to their studio and uh, had a presentation of several houses and enjoyed discussing with their students. So, and as you may already know, they had their experience working with Japanese architects. So Philip practiced with uh, Sana and uh, Anna with Ito Toyo and Amit with Atre Bawa. So, and also the Shibri says, they have a fascination for Toyo Ito, Kazuo Shinohara, Alba Shida, Roberto Venturi, Rodolfo Olojuchi, Peter Melkley, Nario Rotta, and uh, Itsuko Hasegawa. So Hasegawa-san is uh, today is coming, so thank you very much for coming here. Uh, many people applied for this lecture, and uh, it was fully booked in only two weeks. We apologize for the limited number of guests due to the influence of COVID-19, and we plan to shave the little bit limited time video, yes, for those who were unable to attend. So today, we try to have a time to discuss based uh, on Fala's lecture. So please join us. The lecture is called Clocks and Clouds, so please join me in welcoming Fala. Hello. Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, thank you all for coming for what is for us a very special occasion. Uh, the first time we will present our work in Japan, even more special because we are in this building that is a, a personal reference uh, of ours. So thank you very much for attending today. Um, we are a relatively small practice from Portugal. Uh, we are a collective of people. We are four partners, uh, but the team is composed of 10 uh, architects relatively young. I'm the oldest, I'm 35, and the different ages go all the way until 20. So as you can imagine, experience is not our main strength. But maybe that's actually a strength not to be experienced because it allows us to commit mistakes and to value them in a way that normally older practices might not be able to. And this is uh, these are the four partners. And as Saiko said so well, uh, Larry is not here today with us because she's in maternity leave. And in the last decade, uh, we are going to turn 10 years old uh, next year, we accumulated a series of projects. Uh, these projects are in the vast majority residential, small scale, private, so small houses. Uh, most of the times in suburban, relatively an appealing context. Uh, and we understood with time that maybe scale and program were not our uh, 
angle, but the experimentation that the housing program allowed us to, to do could be. And as such, uh, we accumulated about 50 built works until today, and we have a few more in construction. And we like to say that none of these projects individually matters as much as the group, let's say, as the archipelago of all of these islands together does. And I would start this presentation with a dilemma, with the condition in which we find ourselves. If in a way, because it is true that the conditions in which we work are very peculiar, and there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of projects we can do, we like to believe that the house could be indeed a work of art, and that's how we tackle every project we do. That's how we try as much as possible to find meaning in the little things that compose the act of designing a house. It's also true that, uh, to go back to a second quote, it is very clear to us that the, the majority of our clients are not looking for a piece of art when they hire us. They want a service provider. And they want an object that fulfills their expectation. And so we find ourselves in between these two conditions that we really want something to become a piece of art, but at the same time that no one asked us to produce a piece of art. And we very often, maybe because we want to find meaning when meaning is not there, we like to compare to, to do this kind of do it. And very often we do them with our personal heroes and Kazuo Shinohara, as I could highlight it, is one of, is one of them. But our heroes are not just uh, architects. They also come from the world of arts. And sometimes they are not even names. They are gestures, intentions. Sometimes we look for the energy, for a problem-solving possibility in something as simple as the surrealism of a door that when it's open, it's closed, and when it's closed, it's open. And we like to merge the more academic work we do, the research, with this more creative understanding of what a door or an architectural element could be. But this puts us in a, in a strange situation. I would dare to say that probably no one in this room ever visited one of our built works. So this idea of representation of the fiction of the work is very valuable to us. Like the Joseph Kezuf uh, one and three chairs, the plan, the section, the elevation, the wireframe, the model, the building, they all are of equal importance. And today we will show six buildings, but Actually, we will show drawings of those buildings. We will show representations. We will show photos. We will show everything but the buildings because there's no way we could bring them with us. So we often, when invited to present our work in exhibitions, our attempt ends up to be to merge all of the projects into one big project. So again, this idea of the archipelago, of the relation between the project becoming more valuable than each project per se. So the idea of the chair is more important than its definition, its representation, or itself. And as such, this creates a, a, a very abstract condition where we could be seen as a ghost town, as a, a collection of images, and not really an architectural practice. And then we go back to the, the, the scenario in which we operate, where our clients and our commissions are actually not uh, to a certain extent desired. Uh, so as I said before, we are asked to solve a problem and we want to do more than that. We want to fly higher. So this idea of uh, understanding and almost domesticating the coyote uh, kind of summarizes or illustrates the way in which we have to, to produce our practice. And so this, this background, this, uh, this network of regularity in the worlds of uh, Foucault uh, allow us to be truly free. So contrary to a few years ago, where we believed that the conditions that were not perfect were a problem and were somehow stopping us from maybe achieving a higher level than the one we were starting to become accommodated to, we understood that maybe that, uh, let's call it background and network of regularity became the necessary condition for our practice to exist. So it became not just, not a problem, it became a quality. Maybe because this context is the context in which we operate, it helped define us, and today it helps us to go a bit further in the experimentation we want to do. Our projects become free because they are part of that context. Today's lecture is called Clocks and Clouds, and I will not explain exactly why. I think it's going to become more or less hinted during the presentation, and in the conclusion, we will come back to that. Uh, but. To be very pragmatic, we will present six projects. And these six projects, they all share the fact that they are houses, small scale 
houses. So they are all built in Portugal, mostly in Porto, one of them is in Lisbon, and they are all to a certain extent um, experimental in our eyes. Uh, we have to highlight that Portugal is not the most radical of contexts, so the idea of housing is very standardized, almost a prefabricated idea of what housing is, and we try in every one of these projects to go away from such idea. And the first project, Project 58, is called The House with a Curb Law. And it's uh, probably one of our oldest built works, uh, one of the first houses uh, we ever built. It's in a um, relatively irrelevant uh, street, a very narrow back street, in a house that was probably 100 years old when we found it, with granite walls and a tile roof. And that was abandoned for a very long time. It's very common to find properties like this in Portugal, properties that for one reason or another, they just decay. They just become abandoned and slowly are dominated by ivy and um, they start to almost uh, go to a state of ruin uh, when, we, when we find them. And this is the plan of this house as we found it on the floor. It's a house that has only windows on the street and on the garden. And in the middle, you have a series of rooms that have no light, that have no spatial qualities, that are just a sequence of programs that were added over the years. Because you can imagine most of these houses, they had no architect. They were just, uh, no one ever thought about them. They were done out of need. And our, let's say, the game that we tried to play in this, in this project was the understanding of a line as a generator of space. So the whole project is a line. This line is almost thin uh, representation of what a wall could be in a plan, cuts the given system that we were presented with and somehow creates a hierarchy. Suddenly there's what we could call secondary and principal. Suddenly there's a main space and there are secondary spaces. The volume had to be kept for a series of regular uh, regulations and uh, uh, let's say the law imposed so. And there's a dot, a point that shows up there that I will address in a minute. And this is a house, so of course, past the line. So when the line becomes a wall and when the wall becomes the perimeter of a room and the, the rooms together define a house, it is inhabited, it is furnished, it is lived by someone, and it's uh, not about the line anymore. But to us, I would keep the drawing that way. So we often like to say that our project, our work, our production ends in the moment that the client moves in because from that point onwards, it's not our work anymore, it's his house. And the project ends to us in that point. So to summarize this project, you have a column, you have a curve and you have a roof that to a certain extent was imposed. And this roof is very important because it will not only protect the house and the room from the sky, from rain, from the weather, it will also protect the world from the house itself. So it becomes a, a quite important device. It's a very light sheet of metal, uh, the thinnest roof uh, we ever did, but it's at the same time probably one of the strongest devices we could propose. It completely conceals the space from the street. And so this is the condition in which we found the house, as shown before, the construction that preserved all the granite walls, but created new walls inside uh, for the curve, and the thin metal sheet that was placed on top of the metal structure. And after it was finished, it had what we could call a white face and a back face in glass. And this is the project that I was talking about. The roof that is the same roof as before, but now completely different one. The column that with no structural purpose marks the most, uh, the highest point of the construction and the wall that comes from the curve that with four doors identifies the four secondary spaces. And everything was painted in white because we felt that it was important in this project that it would be just about this one idea, about this curve and the relation it has with that column. So we could say this project is just about a few lines, the lines of the profile of the roof, the line of the column, the line of the wall. And when the doors were painted in a strong color and the furniture arrived, suddenly there was a contrast as if the space was irrelevant and just the occupation mattered. So it's a kind of interesting innuendo or even an interesting contrast, I would say, 
between our desire to leave when the client moves in, but at the same time, what happens to the space when it's inhabited and not just uh, architecture anymore, it becomes a house. And this is the opposite perspective. So the opposite one sees when arriving to the room. So actually this column that marks the highest point when you enter, you cannot perceive its full height. So it naturally guides you to look up and to understand that you enter the living space in the highest point of the house. And then the slope of the roof slowly directs you towards the garden because there was a big piece of land in the back. And you see how against the light, the, the doors and the cabinets and the furniture become very dark objects. So the whiteness of the space, this is a, it's an abstract white. It's a white that is aiming at nothingness, allows everything else to become something, to become present, to become important. And this column makes us think about a lot of other columns, but just because maybe the perspective is very, very similar. It reminds us of the House of Light. It reminds us about this column that is in the center of something, although you cannot perceive it as such. It reminds us also of the idea of a before and after, of a column that works as a referential point. A column that in a room that is just an endless void becomes a beginning and an end of the living space. But at the same time, when we see the house fully furnished, inhabited, occupied, it's impossible for us not to think about other ideas of uh, what the domestic space is or could be. And in our case, what we hope it does not become. And this house from Yasumitsu Matsunaga comes, comes to mind uh, when we think about this. And on the outside, when you combine the living space with the roof, because the window is actually at the lowest point of the roof, it suggests a very tiny, very humble, very protected domestic space. And you see just a, a very thin sheet of metal protecting it from the world around. So with, wheel, with metal uh, windows, with a metal pole, with a metal beam, with a metal roof, it kind of reacts in the cheapest possible way. Because as you can imagine, this is a very, very cheap construction to the very heavy granite stone mineral context around it. So the house is the house with a curved wall, but it could also be called the house under a metal roof. And the second project, Project 97, um, it's a project that deals with the domestic space in a slightly more abrasive manner. Um, we call it waves of glass and clouds of metal um, because it's actually what it is composed of. And it's very different from the previous one. It's also a property that was abandoned for a long time, but in this case, just uh, a shop, a tiny shop on the ground floor of a relatively banal 1960s building. This shop has one floor facing the street and two floors facing the garden, where the bottom floor is actually sunken a bit in regards to the outside space. The interior was just empty. This was a shop that never was. So it was designed as a shop in the 60s, but it was never used as such. So for about 50 years, this kind of box or two boxes, because there's another floor below, they were just waiting for something to happen. And in Portugal, it's very difficult to discuss the idea of uh, a housing space or a, a dwelling on a ground floor. The ground floor is given to commerce, it's given to parking, it's given to public programs. So the idea of living facing the street is uh, somehow polemical. But our clients, they were not Portuguese and they bought this property for a relatively good price and they accepted it. Okay, maybe, maybe living on the ground floor is not that bad. And we can, we can work it out. And we try to do a project for it. But this project was, was as much about a house as it was about a drawing. Because as I said before, if we don't set an hierarchy between, um, let's say, if a drawing is not less or more important than the building, and if a collage is not less or more important than a model, so we could say that if the project, that is what we do. We don't build buildings. We, we do projects. We do drawings. We write texts. Maybe the project as a drawing is more important than the house at the end. So what we build is not in the hierarchy of values, more relevant than what we design. And there was a generation of architects from the book that Saeko showed you before that surprised us with the intensity in which they understood drawing, in which you know the ideas of the project were presented in such a clear manner in their drawings that we almost didn't feel the need to look at the plans or the sections or uh, the photos of these houses. These drawings on their own, they were able to tell us almost a full story. And that was very exciting to us. We would like to experiment in a project 
with that possibility, a project that is just one, one drawing. And at the same time, the technology of that time, or this is slightly later, but allowed for a certain kind of experimentation that, let's say, if this tool was not invented, very probably this architecture could never exist. So there was a kind of link between the tool as a matter of production and the lens as a capacity to see the project where the, let's say, the different kinds of drawings that were produced, they were to a certain extent fully defining the architecture that was being created. And so the whole project is this. The whole project is an organism that is created with two facades, one facing the garden, so facing the back, but it's the main facade, so it's the facade that matters, even if facing a private piece of land, a secondary facade facing the street, and then two curves, two lines that, like in the first project, organize all the programs. And when we started to, to, to flirt and to enjoy this kind of representation, we made a test. We talked with our client via these drawings. We expressed our ambitions, not via collages or models, or actually there was not a single model of this project ever done. We showed him wireframes and they understood it. And they started to, you know, to push us even further because there was no real expectation on any kind of representation. So if this was what they saw, this was what we discussed. And the discussion became more and more intense as the project moved forward. And it's at the end, although there's a house, although they live in that house, we could say that in our minds, they live in this trunk. And these are the two, these are the two rectangles, the two boxes I was talking about. Um, the only thing that exists in this box is a small interference of the staircase that goes up the building. And then there's the staircase that brings you to the minus one level. Nothing else. So it's a very blank canvas. And like in the previous project, I said, there are two lines. And these two lines, they separate what we could call a main space on each level from what we could call a private secondary space. And of course, the private spaces, the secondary spaces, they are important for a house. They are not very important for our narrative, but they work. They are there. They sold things as bathrooms, pantry, storage, you know, all of those things that a house needs, but are not as relevant for the for the discourse of the project. But what matters really to us is what happens in these two longitudinal rooms on the top level with the two ends, the street and the garden, and on the bottom level, just with a relation to the garden. So the curves, and, and of course, there were 1000 curves to achieve this one. So it's not easy to draw a, a curved wall. Um, they allowed us to produce what we could call a very subtle uh, set of uh, pragmatic decisions, more space here, less space there, enough space for the bed here, uh, storage space at the entrance, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think that's what really matters when we talk about this project. We could go that one. But I think it's more important to say that what the curve allows us is that we organize a whole living space or what we like to call a living gallery, which has two lines. And the top level is a bit higher than the level below. It's three meters. The level below is just two ten, so it's very tense, very, very uh, compact, one could say. And the top level, the wall is just uh, a glass brick surface with exceptions. The staircase that goes up, the cut that guides you down, the window to the bedroom, while the bottom level, it's completely regular. Equally distance, you have exactly the same door that gives you the same ac the access to the different programs in the same way. And this is how that living gallery looks like on the top level, where when you enter, you have this relationship towards the garden and all the transparency of the glass brick allows the natural light that flows here to somehow invade the private programs behind. And the kitchen, that is an important device because as said, this is a house and not a drawing, at least as a starting point. Um, the kitchen becomes an organism on its own. So it's a kitchen that tries not to be a kitchen, that tries not to look like a kitchen, that is also not trying to be furniture. It's a kitchen that becomes almost like the, the first inhabitant of the space. It's almost like a tiny creature that is inside. And then, and I will talk about it later, the facade and the relationship with the garden creates many different effects of light and reflection along the day and many different possibilities on how the very linear relationship between inside and outside can become uh, exquisite uh, and become a bit more than just uh, an inside and outside condition. And simple things from uh, handles to stripes to cabinets to lamps, they refer to other things. 
they refer to references, to heroes, to paintings, to sculptures, to architects, to architectures. They are an homage of sorts, but at the same time, they become ours uh, to a certain extent. The mixture, the curation of all of these devices, it's our, it's our work. Um, and as you move to the secondary programs, you start to understand how the garden at different times of the day with different lights has more or less presence inside the, inside the house. And at the same time, when doing a renovation like this, so there's a building above, and there's a staircase that somehow breaks through your living room. We felt it was important to understand that this, I don't want to call it mistakes, but these accidents, these things we cannot control, they are valuable. They are part of the project, so they cannot become just something that you hide. Although we have to say that there were probably 50 meetings with a client about the possibility of making that staircase disappear somehow. But in the end, the best way to make it disappear was to make it so proud and present that it became a noble feature and not an accident anymore. And risers and tubes and columns that come from the floors above that cannot be touched, they can be cladded in mirror and somehow participate on a game of deconstruction. Because what happens is via the glass brick, there's no true privacy. There's never a completely opaque room. There's never a moment where someone goes behind a wall and disappears. So that means that you are always in a constant condition of choreography. People living in this house, they become to a certain extent actors that do a kind of daily installation that is their own life that is displayed to each other. And as you go down every single opportunity, the stone that stands on a step, the skirting that rotates over the step, the way how the light operates on the bottom level that is darker and gives more light via the glass brick to the main space and the main space to the secondary ones. All of these tiny, uh, let's call it um, behavioral uh, conditions inform the project. And so it's not just about space anymore. It's not just about color and texture. It's about light. It's about transparency. It's about translucency. It's about a certain kind of erotic feeling that the house that is a drawing can have. And so what needs to happen now is that objects, life, people, you know, stories need to happen in it so that it's not just a drawing anymore and it's really, really just a house. And we like to flirt to different kinds of representation. And in this case, the, the idea of the inhabitation shows up just on these two images. These are simple virtual collages. They just throw some objects over the textures, but they tell you know, enough about the uh, possibility of what is ahead to come. And when dealing with the main facade, um, one of the good qualities of our regulations in Porto is that the front facade is very protected. The city hall has a lot to say about it. But since our plots are very narrow and long, the back facade is normally a private piece for just the usage of the owners. So they are the only people who can go to the garden and see their back facade. And at the same time, it's a device that can become as much a facade of a building, a metal structure, a painting, a structure uh, of a drawing. It can become a lot of things at the same time. And when we were composing this facade, we felt the need to give this to this drawing a face, as if the drawing becomes a creature of sorts, almost an organism, as I said before, and it has its own personality. And this is the main face. This is the, let's say, this is the, the smile that the building does when it winks at us. And this is a facade that is composed of several layers. The wall is cladded in mirror, there's the different windows for the different secondary programs behind. There are the white shutters that allow you to completely close the facade or not. There's the red column that ends the line on both levels. Then there is a substructure that holds the metal plates and the dots of black stone. And suddenly all of these layers are put together and what is a very B-dimensional condition, a drawing, becomes a very three-dimensional facade. And so when all of them are together, the reflection of the neighbors on the other side of the, of the garden, the moiré effect from the reflection of the metal mesh, the duplication of the structure that supports the stones, all of this becomes part of a visual, plastic, three-dimensional uh, game. And all of these angles allow us to see something more. The stripes of the kitchen on the back are somehow now diluted with the reflection of the neighbors. The lines of the metal plates are somehow now merged 
with the lines of the staircase that they help to protect. And at different times of the day, the way how the interior and the exterior relate change. The way how the sun hits the glass, providing a certain reflection, and how the shadow hits the interior, providing more or less a privacy, more or less, uh, let's say, poetry to the simple things of the day, like the ray of light coming in the kitchen counter. And it's very interesting to see how something that is as banal as a wall, when cladded in mirror, becomes as important as a window. And at some times during the day, it reflects the trees on the other side of the garden. So the trees that are part of you know, the city or the garden or the backyard, in this case, they become part of the facade. So they are now an active piece of this elevation, as if we were the ones designing those trees as part of this, uh, of this facade. But at some point, the light changes a bit. And suddenly, the people that inhabit the house, they become part of the facade itself. So the living organism becomes, to a certain extent, uh, collaborative with the user. And at the end of the day, the facade disappears and just the light exists. And these conditions and these different times uh, of the day and these different let's say, amounts of opacity and translucency and light and shadow, etc. they make the facade more than just a static condition. It becomes a very organic one. And of course, this is not uh, something new to us. I mean, we have been seeing a lot of representations while doing this research on this uh, condition of how to work with metal, how to work with light as part of the design of a building. And at the same time, how to deconstruct the building via photography. And uh, the work of Kojitaki was very important to us, mostly the photographic work. Of course, the critical work was important, but in this case, I would like to target just the photographic one in the sense that what was a common understanding of what a building looked like and how it was documented became to us something else. And we are very much interested in that. And we like to collaborate with different people, different photographers that somehow give us more from the building than the building uh, the building itself. And again, when we shift the lens from light to darkness, suddenly the tiny, the tiny moments of light become very important. And this condition where what was actually made to bring light um, becomes opaque and artificial light and natural light, they all come together. And the way how the reflection on the pavement that is just styled and on the glass brick and on the mirror and on the painting uh, appear, it's uh, very different in each case. And as you go out to the street, you have what we could call the front facade, the public facade, the facade that is dealing with a public space that is just a tiny composition of a white door, a big black circle, a red line, and some metal cups. So my turn. Um, <clears throat> so. The two projects, the two houses that I'm going to show today uh, are residential projects are actually very special. Uh, one, because it was this one, one of, or the first house we ever designed uh, from scratch. Um, and the other one, one um, uh, quite recent building um, in Porto. And this one, <clears throat> sorry, was actually, is actually ca called House for Three Generations based on the problem. So the clients just wanted a retirement house, a uh, house for three generations, for them, for the kid and for the grandparents, if they would come. Um, and actually, this was the first time where we didn't have um, a defined uh, boundary for our building. So we were so lost that we, of course, decided to make a square. Um, and then it, it was all about how to, to understand these private units and how these private units could help define the, um, the public areas of the house. So um, how to divide a square, it's always um, an interesting exercise when we had three uh, independent moments to help um, divide in the program. Uh, three bedrooms with private bathrooms and then one common area for the living room. And it actually became quite interesting, even though we are using uh, very basic shapes for the definition of these private areas. The uh, common area, um, it's the leftovers or it's the direct reflection of these private entities into the, let's say, the public space um, of the house. 
Um, so there's all these metrics that we try to define uh, squares inside the squares. There's uh, the a common um, paths in the middle, uh, rules and the exceptions uh, to define it. But then when it gets inhabited or when it gets furnished, then it becomes actually quite clear how uh, we enter and we are guided into the living room and into the big window. Uh, and when there's a moment that uh, it separates the living room from the kitchen area, even though um, everything is open. Um, and then it also becomes a question on how can we reflect this on the outside? Do we design a perfect box or not a perfect box? Um, and all these rules and um, that we define to ourselves for each private unit uh, that is defined by um, uh, by one square window and one uh, circle. Uh, and this square, it's the same as the roof. That is the same of um, some shadings. And all the corner facades are the same, except the exception that is the living room. So all these elements come together. And in this case, these um, representations were actually helped us uh, explain better the project. So they, these were some of the exceptions um, of projects that were done after, of drawings that were done after the projects. But that we also realized that it helped us clarifying a lot of these topics that we were discussing um, in the beginning. So the um, project itself or the house um, was again quite simple with a central axis uh, that would rotate, the wood would rotate ar around it. And there was this very important element in the center um, that was a column um, that was actually the a very important moment of a decision in in our office, a, a kind of a shift, uh, because actually this is a column that doesn't touch the ceiling because it's non-structural, it's not needed. The full house, the perimeter is holding the house, uh, but we really wanted this element to help us um, to become a device that helps separating the um, area of the kitchen and the area of the living room while you enter. And a column or a pillar is say, the minimum device that you can, or the smallest wall you can have to actually make this um, separation. Uh, but it really helps physically uh, defining it. But then the, our structural engineer said, like, you don't need it, of course. Then why would it touch the ceiling? So it's not structure. Um, it's an architectural, uh, architectural element. It's an um, architecture device. So in the end, it actually doesn't touch the ceiling. So um, you will always see a bit the <coughs> sorry, uh, the shadow, <laughs> and this is the entrance, and the entrance helps you guiding to um, to the corner window to the light. The kitchen is on the other side, so the curve naturally guides people to the area that you want. Of course, if you look back, you will see the kitchen; it's not enclosed. Um, but there's always this element of rotation um, that helps organizing uh, the space and organizing the different rooms and the, the different aspects of it. So for each space, each private area, there's only one door with a strong or with not the strongest color, but at the time it was the strongest color we had. Um, and then there's always this um, relation between the different elements, the different doors, mm -hmm. and the kitchen that we wanted it to look more like a furniture element than like a kitchen um, itself. Um, and then, of course, because this uh, element doesn't touch the ceiling, um, with uh, some experiments from some um, photographers, you can actually perceive with the shadows um, that because on site it's quite, it's just 15 centimeters, so it's not very present, this, um, this separation uh, from the ceiling, so it's not the first thing that you notice when you enter the house is that it's a non-structural column, but for us it's, for, it's the most important element of it. And again, one of our first projects we had a kind of a triangle side. We decided to make a square, and of course we made it nor perfectly north-south, so 
then all corners get proper light. Um, but the location of it, it's in a village, actually, uh, uh, my hometown village. Um, and you, you could almost feel that there's a relation between our project, uh, our project and, and, the, and the neighbors. All the neighbors hate the house. They all say it's very ugly. <laughs> Um, but the clients were actually living abroad, so they are very proud of their own house. Um, but even though in the beginning we thought we were contradictory, uh, contradicting the, the site, in the end it feels quite well integrated uh, with the surroundings. So it's not a very beautiful village in Portugal. It's not like Japan, they are all ugly and that's it. Um, but uh, we felt that this small jewelry piece uh, in this neighbor um, actually makes sense. And depending on the side you come from, because the, there's a big slope on all sides, sometimes this uh, the house almost disappears into the ground. Um, sometimes it starts detaching. Um, or from the bottom, it's almost elevated um, from the neighbors. And here you can see the entrance, but all the square windows and the round window that repeats, this is the entrance, this is the kitchen, and that it goes all the way around. And then again, has the light hits, or um, depending where you look at it, it almost disappears um, from the surroundings. And the second project, it's actually the opposite. It's um, it's in the middle of um, of Porto, uh, very close to our uh, to our office. And in Porto, there's this condition of um, of buildings that have more or less five six meters wide uh, dimensions, and quite often they get demolished and nothing happens, or the rules change and suddenly you can build a much bigger uh, building. So. <clears throat> Uh, because no one knows when this will disappear or be replaced. There's all these blank facades that happen all over the city. There are facades that are supposed to one day, no one knows when, there will be a building against it. But sometimes they stay like this for 50 years. Um, and it was always a topic very important for us and um, that we always struggled, like why not do something with those facades? You cannot legally open any window. So in in Porto, all the buildings are really stuck to each other. It's not like here that there's a gap in between each building. They are all always leaning against each other. So you cannot open <laughs> any kind of window. Um, so when we actually got <coughs> sorry an opportunity to to one of these buildings, after we actually renovated one of these interior projects, um, we got um, the opportunity to do another project next to a project that we had just finished, um, and that we had this condition that we had to uh, follow the, the shape of the neighbor, so that was not defined by us. Um, but we would create, because we didn't have the two plots, so we would create a new blank facade. Um, and this new blank facade actually became the first moment of uh, the first moment of discussion of the project because how can you uh, work with a facade that you know there is gonna, not going to be any window, there's going to be completely flat. Um, but it's actually it's not like you it's not a decorated shed, but it, you actually want to introduce some sort of three dimensionality into a fully flat uh, surface. Um, so after many tests, we um, convinced the client to just spend a little bit more money um, on this side facade because he also had to insulate it anyway, uh, into adding these stripes and these patterns of uh, marble that is super cheap in Portugal because it's Portuguese marble, so it's cheaper than wood, for example. Um, so we convinced the client to actually, because this was um, a building to be sold after, uh, that it could invest a bit more and people will see it uh, from several sides and it would be easier to sell. So this was the, art, the client's art, uh, or the argument we gave to the clients, but of course we had all these other uh, intentions uh, behind. Um, and here you can see the the entrance to our previous project, 
the old shacks there uh, are still remaining, but we cannot touch because it's not ours. And the new building and the relation between these different uh, elements and how it relates with with the um, with the surroundings. And because the marble is uh, uh, on top of the of the insulation and it, it's shiny, depending on where you look, it actually gives different kinds of points of views and patterns into it. So then again, we look at this project, we have this fixed box, we solve the, the surroundings, but then um, we need to fit as many apartments as possible inside. But in Portugal, there are limits for like the minimum apartment, it's 52 square meters. So if we divide the square meters of the plot and of how many levels we could have by uh, by 52, we could have three units. Then how to make three units inside this five by 15, more or less, uh, building. Um, and the other um, question is how to access these different floors. Because the um, to fulfill all the handicap accessibility regulations and fire escape, actually, they tend to become quite big elements. Um, so, the first thing was to solve the, or first we solved the facade, then the second thing was to solve the, the access, the staircase, um, and now to actually take advantage of the space. So you enter on this side, the, the garden with the other projects is on, on this one. So here is the minimum height, which is um, 2.4. And then you can start to feel all these kinks that happen here on the section are actually um, direct um, consequences of the staircase because they are actually hiding these uh, different ways of accessing and uh, giving the biggest amount of volume to the other apartments. Um, so these lines that sometimes we play in, in plan, we also play in section and try to see how this, uh, this can be combined and how these different uh, elements uh, are combined together. And um, another decision that we made is that all the slabs uh, are exposed concrete uh, on the ceiling. So everything that is not a part of the slabs, they actually become um, uh, green with a color. So all these elements are the, let's say the fake ceilings that we uh, add to hide the, the different uh, areas of the staircases and to emphasize the, um, the volumes of each space. So this space is quite quirky and quite complex. Uh, we actually also need a, a access to the roof. So there's a, a seven, seven meters tall uh, hole here, um, uh, there to actually get light and it helps illuminating all the, all the common areas. And of course, this, um, this allow us to experiment uh, uh, different connections, different angles, but also with the photographers, as Philip was saying, different points of views and uh, different experiments on how um, these um, spaces that are just emergency staircases, let's say, um, become actually almost representational uh, spaces and actually become uh, one of the main topics uh, of a residential project. Um, so quickly here, uh, the organization. So you enter, you need a 115 meters for a wheelchair. So um, when you enter, then the staircases need to be one meter wide. So you enter here, you have a top part with a kitchen and a lower part with a, with a living room and a bathroom. You go up, again, you need to have 1.5 here to enter this apartment in the middle. You always have double side apartments. Um, with kitchen in one side, uh, uh, living, bedroom, whatever, in the other side or bedrooms. Um, and then on the last floor, you go up, again, you need to turn, you need to turn, uh, and you arrive into two bedrooms. Then you go up again, and you arrive into the living room. Um, and this hole is the hole that gives light into the space. So. You turn, 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 turn. But then this way, you never lose the um, actually the space below. You always um, can use the the space below a staircase or above a staircase to give 
uh, different uh, feelings and meanings into the uh, into the apartment. So all these lines that feel sometimes random, they all solve problems. They help us define specific moments um, and take advantage as much as possible uh, of the available space. Um, so this became almost um, other scenographies in, into our own project. Um, we do a lot of these kind of drawings where we do interior elevations because it's almost as the outside and the inside elevations are equally important. And they create these different moments, these different mo uh, of, uh, of connections between the staircase that goes up and the space that goes below and how these um, pavements uh, help detach the walls uh, from the floor and from the ceiling. Um, or how these compositional el uh, elements come together solving problems but also helping um, uh, emphasizing different ideas of the project than the kitchen is here behind but you always see through but then of course um, when there's also the these red shades when when you turn uh, turn them down they also give an impact on the inside on on what's also happening um, on the outside. <laughs> Um, and uh, um, these patterns that, as I was saying before, also they help us detach uh, from the walls. Um, if it was, uh, we started using different kinds of food sometimes uh, to emphasize, sometimes because we had different budgets, we couldn't spend uh, the money in, in expensive wood, or so we, we used two kinds of woods. Uh, but in this particular case, because in the project doesn't have one direction, it has um, all the sides are equally important. We have this pattern that we um, that it allows to be heated by whatever we do uh, inside the apartment um, and define some of its characteristics. So, as I was saying, walls detach, ceiling detach, floor uh, in terms of. The materials and all these moments that help um, emphasizing the staircases on the common spaces into the private spaces too. Then all these moments of reflection um, that allows us to either see on the entrance through or see different elements uh, of the project itself or when we just really wanted to have a different kind of detail um, where you wouldn't perceive the thickness of the walls, uh, so you actually uh, set the wall back and you clad it in your mirror, so it kind of um, uh, dissolves uh, the wall into the neighbors and the surroundings. Um, and then this is a a very important moment for the municipality, which is this alignment. Um, but actually gives very interesting um, com uh, comparison between the different projects or the relations between them. And and this used to, uh, is the, the other projects of ours that we uh, we also had a garden on and then we could actually have uh, this view from the back that in this case it's as important as the front uh, facade and as important as the side facade. Uh, but it actually helps integrating into the into the neighborhood, um, and you can uh, feel that this is we remove this blind facade and we try to integrate it uh, it with the uh, with the neighbors. So, um, yeah, I think we have two more minutes. I will try to be efficient. Um, this project number seventy nine. We call it suspended house. I think, um, in a way, it has many similarities with some of the things we discussed already. It's on this plot here, very central in Porto. And like the project that uh, Anna mentioned, it also has this condition of having a five meter facade. So you can open on the street and in the back, and, and that's it. So it's a very typical condition, as you can see, most buildings. Are like that in Porto. And here we're facing a quite 
um, unusual for us uh, request from the client, which was basically, he told us, I want a boring house. I want a house where all the rooms are rectangular. And we thought, okay, why not? And we took this as a starting point. Um, basically, this level in the middle is the entrance level. Uh, the garden is one level below. So this is the living room. Um, and on the top floor, you have bedrooms. I mean, actually an office and the bedroom. And we decided to consider all the rooms as equal, whether there is a staircase in it, or if it's a bedroom, or actually this one is a garage. Um, they are all equal rooms. The only exception is the bottom level where the whole floor becomes a room. Um, and basically, because of those that request, um, and also some regulations that I'm go not going to explain in detail, but um, this moment became extremely important because this, the minimum width of this is not the same as the minimum width of this. And this is the center of this plan. And this distance is also a minimum that makes a misalignment here. So basically that column in the middle needed to have doors that are not aligned. So the, the, the perfect cross was not perfect. And we took this as the, we thought that basically the system has this imperfection and we're gonna use that imperfection to, to make the project. And so we basically decided that this column was gonna have a different profile from every room. So within each room, uh, when the doors are closed, you see something different. And so it became this quite odd, oddly shaped column. Um, this is its profile, but we thought, okay, it's funny. So it's a boring project, but it has a funny moment. And this is the kind of um, what it looks like from each room. So you see the two doors, the column in the middle, and this with the column, or with the doors open. I was going to say the column open, almost. Um, and the pattern on the floor is actually very simple. Um, cheap marble from Portugal. It's a local um, material, but we used it here. Basically each of these squares is made of a lot of squares so that it's small pieces and it remains quite cheap. But the idea was that the floors detach from the system, they're not submissive to the, to the walls. And so this is basically another room. And so we were looking of course at, um, let's say, at the expression and the sort of um, almost, um, fragmented within their profile uh, columns of some Gothic architecture, but of course, as Philip mentioned, uh, Marcel Duchamp's door. And, this, and so this was a bit what we had in mind when developing that moment. But so this is, again, what I was saying, each room, this is what they look like, look like to us in collage and here in reality. So the rooms are neutral in a way, whatever happens in them can actually change. And on the other hand, uh, on the bottom level, you have one gigantic room that is kitchen, dining, living that opens to the garden. But we realized also that this column in the center didn't need to be structural because there's only five meters between the two sides. And so we decided, okay, let's make it fly because on this level, it doesn't even need to be a hinge for the doors. So we actually detached it from the floor, which was very practical because then you can actually clean under it. And this is actually the favorite place of the cat of the house. This is a photo from under that column, looking up. And in the end, you have that object that is not exactly a column, or if it's a column, it's not a column in the sense of something tectonic. And it almost becomes um, a person in the room that you always have to negotiate with. And every time you go to the staircase, you and almost shake hands with it. So this was a bit um, our intention for that object, but it also, of course, underpins the whole system. So the whole system exists also here. And this is something that, of course, the client was a bit uh, worried about in the beginning, but we, you know, with a lot of discussions, we tried, we managed to, to, to sort of convince him. Um, it is still under debate actually today. But so the whole system, comes down and exists in that living room, even though, let's say, on a purely functional level, it doesn't need. And here you can see also the two different facades. This one, of course, is three level, this one two levels. But the goal of that column was that it, it challenged 
a bit what a column is, of course. And we were thinking at this kind of um, at this drawing by uh, Takamatsu. There is an, what we liked here was the idea of that this is an object that is ambiguous. Is it a column? Maybe it depends on how you look at it. Uh, but also it exists within a certain uh, network, uh, perhaps a uh, network of regularity, as we were mentioning before. And so this is, on the outside, the back facade. Aligned with the column, you have this drain pipe that is also, also structuring the facade in a way that is quite unusual within this kind of architecture. But the building was also trying to relate to the banal architectures of the place, as you can see these buildings, perhaps being a slightly more joyful version of this type of uh, Porto architecture. And on the street, same thing, with the same drain pipe lining and um, a different kinds of necessities on the side. Also perhaps you know, trying to relate to everything that that street is made of. And now the last project, I think is also in a way, a system, a quite clean system, I would say quite rational, but trying to explore the limits of where that rationality uh, brings you. We, can, we call it House of Countless Windows. You will understand why quite fast. It was for this plot, which is um, in Lisbon. So here, as I was saying before, in Porto, we very often have these five meter wide plots quite deep. Here, it was actually the opposite. Um, the building has a quite wide facade, but needs to be quite shallow, so not much depth, because there is a very strong slope in the back. So this is actually during demolitions, but this is the garden that is extremely uh, steep and that we had to play with. And this is the kind of insane construction we actually had to build to retain the ground um, of the garden. But each of these platforms has actually a garden on top, but I will not talk so much about the garden. This is the garden from the house today. And there's an airport nearby, of course. Uh, and this is the back facade. So the, the really the slope falls into that facade that is the same as the street facade. And this is the amount of windows we have. As you can see, it's a lot of small windows. You can see here you have a two level or three level building. This is actually a three level building too, but it has, it feels almost much bigger it feels like a five or six level building, even though it's actually much smaller. And this is a giraffe for scale, of course. And um, so this is what the facade looks like now. You can see the alignment with the three level buildings around. Um, and the reason of that is that this is what the municipality cares about. The municipality imposes that the pattern, the, actually the horizontal rhythm of the windows of the neighbors matches ours. But they don't care so much about the vertical expense. So actually we had to play with that rhythm. I mean, you don't see a lot here, but it basically follows that same rhythm. But in in the vertical dimension, we could do a bit what we wanted. So we took this as a, as a cue to do the project. This is the pattern of windows seeing both front and back and the interior system. So basically what we decided was we would do the project with this spatial system. The reason for that is that the client wanted um, a lot of rooms, more than what a three-level building would allow for. It. So basically, the, the the project is three and a half level. It uses the slope of the street as a starting point. So on the lower level, you have here um, a garage, and then you have bedrooms, 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 bedrooms. And on the last two levels, you have the common spaces. So it was a way to gain one room, but it also means that you have this staircase in the middle and then each half level, you have a room on one side, on the other. Yeah. And so all the rooms are going through the body and this system of section basically defines the facade. So on each room, you have two levels of windows, one against the floor, one against the ceiling. And this is what basically makes the architecture. So this is a section with a bit more constructive detail, of course. Furniture was a bit difficult in such a plan, so we had to um, design quite a bit of it ourselves. And this is, well, the relationship between the two. What we found interesting is that the fact that all the rooms cross, um, but of course, 
through that multiplicity of windows. So for example, this is the kitchen and dining. It has eight windows. Um, this is a bedroom, same thing. But even the bathrooms in this plan have at least four windows, each of them. And so this is the kind of relationship you have to between the two sides. And we uh, conceived these um, wooden shutters because that was probably the most efficient way to um, to do the shuttering of such a weird facade. And then during construction phase, and we decided here again to play with um, glass bricks so that the whole system could, would be perceived or perceivable at least. So in each of these rooms, you, you, you can see through the other room in a distorted manner. And this is, so be, because of that, also the glass brick became the module that defines the whole construction, of course, it's a very demanding material because of that. So each floor height, each side of each size of window, etc., had to be conceived uh, from the dimensions of the glass brick. And this is all the plans, as I was saying. So each uh, live, each bedroom, each uh, bathroom on the side here goes through. And of course, this is the whole game of proportions I was mentioning. And we try to still within that system find some, a bit of, um, not irregularity, but to explore the, the different, the variations that are possible within that quite strict system. And this is a section showing all the levels. So in a way it is kind of comparable to this kind of system where you don't know anymore if the canvas comes before the lines are on it and if all the rooms, um, if each room comes before the totality of the whole thing. And so here you can see um, through the whole system once again. And this is the collages we did for each room. You can see that they're all the same again. So again, um, exposed concrete on the ceiling, quite cheap marble on the floor, and then glass brick. And this is the last level where you have the kitchen and dining, so seen from both sides. And the very last floor, that is the, the living room. So that is quite compressed, so it has just one level of windows. So this is a bit, through that whole system, what we wanted, that you can perceive somebody else in any floor at any moment, in a way. And well, the glass bricks as they are, the kind of light that you get even when the shutters are closed, but some other shutters are open, and the kind of distortion you see through that. So it's never absolutely perfect. It's not transparency as a, let's say, totalizing thing, but it's something more uh, mediated, I would say. And here, looking from one room to the other, the kind of relationship you have in the staircase. And on the last levels, it all ends on that big vault. As you can see, here is the kitchen. And from the top of the kitchen, looking towards the the very cozy living room that is here with its own its single row of windows so this is in a way we thought the system needed to end somehow we, we actually um, discussed many options for this but this is the one that was the most convincing in the end to clearly cut the system at a certain height there is even a one meter tall door here. So it's really the exact same system that is just sawn off. And there is only the vault uh, covering this and that um, kitchen element that are the only thing that, um, let's say, do the punctuation of that ending. And of course, as uh, Saiko was mentioning, we, let's say that vault perhaps uh, came to our minds because of some of the architectures we were looking at. Of course, we think we everything we do somehow comes from somewhere, and we'd rather try to find out what that somewhere is rather than, than be passive about it. And of course, there are many J Japanese architectures that could relate to that, but this is just a small sample of uh, what we did with those Toronto students, which is this book. So it was a quite um, a long endeavor and quite painful in um, archiving and researching these houses. But of course, the goal was never to imitate anything from there, but rather to try to understand what motivated and what made this architecture somehow meaningful in a certain moment. So 
in the end, I think the big question is what kind, what do you look at, but also what kind of distance do you find for it? So I think in the end, um, this is something that finds a certain distance as well. It is very much fitting in its context, but also finding a right distance to that. So I think it's always a, a matter of uh, mediation between these things. And in the end, this is the pattern of windows of that uh, seemingly gigantic building that actually is extremely cozy inside. And we liked also to play with uh, mirrors here to, to sort of uh, detach the, the main patterns of windows from its neighbor. And so we mentioned Kojitaki once already, but I think um, here what interested us is um, what, whatever he calls meaning giving structure. And I think this is defining what that structure can be is perhaps what most projects are trying to do. So it's not necessarily that it is about form, but perhaps it relies on the reinterpretation of each element within each project. So the windows within this project have a totally different meaning than these that I just showed. And they have a totally different meaning for the domesticity and the way people live within these two buildings, for instance. And the actually the title of the lecture, The Clocks and Clouds, from comes from a quite a text we like a lot from Karl Popper from the 60s, in which he basically says that um, there have been two views of physics to try to understand the world in, at his time, let's say. The first one, trying to understand everything as a clock, so everything as a determined system. And then another one, trying to understand everything physical in the world as a cloud, so something essentially unpredictable. And he says that none of these two views is um, sufficient or satisfactory. So in the end, what we are looking for is something intermediate, like an organism, but not alive. And he says that you need to understand the only possible solution is to understand systems that control each other, that are in some sort of dynamic relationship. And so it can be neither fully blocked nor fully cloud. And perhaps architecture is a bit like that in some way, um, because architecture is always in between things that are measurable, um, predictable, and things that are not measurable, like, I don't know, beauty, comfort, um, desires, um, fictions, perhaps. Um, and so everything we do needs to play with these two things and is always in tension between these two things. So this is why we like this idea of um, thoughts and clouds. And this is perhaps how we end up in the most surprising things. So. In the end, the project I showed just before is extremely rational, and it's made of things we all know, uh, doors, windows, um, floors, slabs, etc. But And it uses them in a rational manner in order to end up somewhere that would not be predictable. So this is perhaps what we try to do with all projects. And um, I think it also relates, of course, to the way we represent them. And, try to photograph them. So that's it for us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your English. Thank you for your great lecture. It is quite yeah it's quite interesting. And uh, honestly I felt it, yeah it, it's very mysterious I, because I felt uh, opposite feeling opposite atmosphere, the one is very relaxed, but uh, on the other hand, the another is uh, more sensitive and, how to say, more serious and very high tension. I don't know why, but anyway, the, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, Farad's first lecture in Japan. Then, as Saiko mentioned in the beginning, when we published the host of this lecture, uh, suddenly uh, the seat is full result, sold out. So uh, as you know, the, in Japan, especially the younger generations, 
are very fascinated with Farah's works and discussing the possibility for new architecture or new spaces. So uh, when we think that reason, uh, it is a bit difficult to say. Uh, <clears throat> Of course, Farah referred uh, many several Japanese architects architecture uh, as a how to say as a allusion, mm, but but maybe it is not the main reason. I think so. Uh, maybe I don't know how to say, but some of characteristics of uh, two-dimensional spaces, or how to say some new composition or something. So uh, maybe we can talk and maybe find some words for that reason in this discussion. So I want, we want to move to the questions and answer part from the audience. So uh, if you have some questions, please hands up and don't hesitate to ask. This is a First question and answer in Japan for Farah. Yeah. What, what is being a fart? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a well, I. Fara means speech in Portuguese. Speech. Yeah, speak in the third, um, uh -huh. third person. Uh -huh. But it also is our mission of our persons. It's Philip, and that is uh, a method of Philip. And uh, 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 so it's, um, it has taken many meetings okay. within our office. But <coughs> that's. It's as simple. Yeah, it's, it's really as simple as that. But we don't. Um, I don't think we wanted to infuse a lot of meetings with that name, Philip. Thank you. Uh, Professor Stewart is very yeah. related to the... We know his books, of course. <laughs> do, do you have any other uh, comment about some relationship between some Japanese architects and their works? Or how, how did you feel that? Uh, uh, I saw some other things. I saw some Magri. I think it's good to keep an open mind and keep us sources of inspiration. Were you been in Japan for a long time? Philippe and I are here for a week and a year until the end of the year. Oh, the end of the year. So you have a chance to go around? Yes, but we also all um, worked in Japanese offices, and we have been here a few times in the last 20 years. Ah. But of course, always a uh, uh, variety. Ah. Good. Okay. Okay. Actually, it's, it's a thing that um, outside of Portugal, we are often described as very Portuguese in Europe. <coughs> And in Portugal, we are described as very non-Portuguese. So I think the, the references have something to do with that. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the lecture. And uh, I was really, really enjoying it. And it was really exciting for me. And I have two questions. And one is about uh, you, you guys uh, explaining about the wireframe with uh, using that for a presentation for client. And actually, how how many clients can understand the guys' presentation with that wireframe? Because in my in my opinion, sometimes it's very difficult. You know, just it's really they need a lot of knowledge or a lot of like you know, how to say. Like uh, uh, that, something like that, and so I just want to ask, ask about the point. And the other one is about the drawings. And actually, I'm an architect in Japan, and I was really uh, fascinated about the uh, drawings. 
and with that, especially the color, the color and the composition of that space is a very really fascinating. And I think in that mind, in my opinion, that I feel that in your drawings and in your like the actual space, there is the, the difference of the textures. Like uh, in your drawings, are a bit more matte and with with some more, like uh, rare rare feelings or touchings. But in your actual space, you guys are using a lot of the like, glossy, like uh, because I'm not, I'm not sure about maybe about the natural light or something about like the reflections. But I just want to ask you about the such kind of like, uh, difference between the drawings and then the the real space. So. Do you have two questions? I just want to ask. So I, I will try to address the first question. I don't think any client asks for a specific kind of drawing. They normally ask for a kitchen, a bathroom, tiles, doors, colors. I mean, they, they tend to be, in that sense, very down to earth. They show up with a Pinterest photo of a house they want, normally terrible house, but that's the one they normally ask for. And um, they normally think that on the first meeting we're going to discuss the tiles for the bathroom. So that's how the conversation starts. And the process of doing a project is a long-lasting project uh, process, so it takes time. And it takes a lot of dialogue, conversations, you know. The ball goes, the ball comes, and we keep exchanging information. But what is a fact is that we always talk with the clients via the information we provide them. It's not a client that shows up with models and drawings and collages, no, we are. So what we understood with time is that the drawings we propose for the discussion are the drawings we are going to discuss. And as weird or less obvious as a wireframe might feel like, it's actually not. Even a five-year-old can understand it. You know, this is the door, this is the window, this is the... And we don't show one wireframe and discuss it for one hour. We show maybe 50 of them in different positions. And sometimes we even enter the wireframe 3D model to talk about, about something. And when we do that, the main quality is that the discussion becomes about how the lines intersect the perimeter, how the curve ends in a diagonal, how the, the proportion of this room and the proportion of that room interact with each other. And we don't discuss styles for the bathroom anymore. Later on, we will discuss those things with other kinds of drawings. But what the wireframe allows us, and the wireframe the same way, the single line plan and the other drawings, is to focus the discussion in a territory where we can discuss architecture. Because no client, as I said, wants to discuss architecture as a disciplinary condition. They want to discuss very down-to-earth things. But if we do it for a few days, a few meetings, a few weeks, at some point, I think we get always a bit closer to them, but they also get much closer much closer to us. And that's where the other drawings uh, show up. Okay, so maybe I'll add another thing. Um, this process of the design part, it takes for us minimum from, I would say, from three to six months, depending, because sometimes we need to submit basic drawings for, appro for municipality approval, then we have time to develop. So. It gives us also time to educate the clients. But it's true that not all the clients can understand drawings. But they cannot, usually those also cannot understand the models. They cannot understand a plan, they cannot understand a section. Um, but they also don't really understand images. It, it, it's, um, it already happened to us sometimes saying yes, yes, yes to everything. And then when we start building, like, oh, so that's how it looks like. Um, that's common because it's something that you need to train your brain to to it's something that you learn but sometimes it takes longer to, for uh, some people than other of course we as architects we get trained to see things that are not there or imagine how this thing is actually intersecting with something else um, so this is also an educational process with clients also because quite often we don't work as Philip said in the beginning with rich clients or educated clients we work with very normal people that just need someone to sign the paper and somehow they end up <laughs> knocking in our door <coughs> Sorry. and um, 
so they need to learn also who Fale is or what we do or what we don't because usually they don't come uh, maybe in the past two years we have a few projects um, that the clients come to us because they know our work but that's something very recent something that before it didn't it's happen it's not the case in these projects uh, it's not the case in yes it's not the case in most of these projects um, so it also forces us to find new ways to communicate with clients uh, but then also has a, for the second question, as Philip was saying, we use many tools to test different things from plans, sections, uh, not models because those take too long, um, uh, images, collages, and for the materiality we test them in also very different ways, um, both from collages <coughs> or from color drawings. And but um, actually, we usually get the opposite reaction. People say, like, your collages really look like your even like the photographs of the project. Um, but the advantage of real life, let's say, is that there's the proper reflections, there's um, other qualities of the materials that you can only test with samples. So we do a lot of samples, we do a lot of tests, um, but we are not too... Uh, obsessed with getting that kind of uh, image that we do exactly in our real life project. So we know when something is reflected, what will happen. We know that maybe if you look frontally, you will see it uh, in plain colors. If you look diagonally, it will dissolve. So it also um, incorporates a bit the point of view on the different projects. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> um, uh, thank you for the presentation. And I uh, really appreciate actually what uh, you're trying to do, especially in Portugal, like work and develop regulations that can control the non addiction. Um, and I also like I really appreciate also like, what you can achieve in a small space. So just this is just a general comment. Um, my question is like when you started the lecture, you quoted Kazu Shinohara, and um, the quote was like about the society. Like if we should do some tiny house of work that is connected to the society, and if this work is not related to the society, it should not be exist. So I understand that Kazushinohara house is super related to Japanese culture and um, Japanese tradition, and it's somehow connected to Japanese society. So if you quote Kazushinohara about this, especially this one about society, how can you read um, your architecture and its connection with society or Portuguese society? Well, I'm going to say something that's going to make both of them get very mad, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I think that we are an architecture practice that built buildings, that you know fulfills the desires of clients, that does all of those things. But deep down, we build for ourselves, and we build for the moment where, like now, we can communicate our work. So to have a very direct answer to your question, I could say that. The relationship we have with society happens in moments like this, when we have the chance to try to communicate something bigger than the houses themselves. Because 50 people live in 50 houses, but 1 million people can get to know the work, or maybe just one, it doesn't matter, it's not about quantity, but that we can communicate it. And to go down to the last quote that was shown from uh, Kojitaki, maybe to us, the real work we produce are not those houses, they are just another representation of the project, of the rhetoric of the project. And very honestly, uh, that's why we show two quotes, not just one. We show that one and another quote below. We are in this dilemma, in this constant dilemma between wanting to do something that is just that. We want to design architecture for the architecture, for the pleasure it provides us, for the, you know, the, the intellectual capacities uh, it triggers in us, the, 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 the intentions. But we have to fulfill a service to a third party. So the society aspect is not on the fulfilling service. In that case, we just do it, but I mean, we are not going to talk about gravity here. It's not, that's not it. 
What really matters to us is that rhetoric, that capacity of communicating the ideas to a wider audience, and in that case, I would say, you matter much more than the clients. The representation matters much more than the building. The discourse matters much more than everything else. So that's maybe, I would say, my attempt at answering that question. And I think, in a way, <coughs> the, even in the very physical life of the built building, there is something that always tries to challenge whatever is preconceived. So I think this is also about simply stating you know, a different way of inhabiting the world is possible. So it's different in, in our case, let's say. The difference is mostly a matter of uh, position, the way it organizes the sort of life. I think, um, I think that that small challenge that it poses simply to the buildings around them is, is also about that. This is, let's say, society can be understood in, let's say, it has many facets. Maybe I want to Maybe I want just one more thing, which is, um, at least when we were in school, maybe, uh, the idea is that only public buildings actually have an impact on society uh, or, on a, or on a city. For us, and the idea of the private unit and maybe changing one thing at a time can also have a bigger impact. Because actually, most of uh, the world, let's say, it's not built out of uh, public buildings, it's built out of private small units. So if you can challenge the 99% the of construction, then you will actually have an impact on society, much more than um, a public building. Of course, we can always say, okay, we never did any public building and was a few temporary things. Um, so it could also mean that we are trying to find a way to justify our own work. But um, it was actually yesterday we were having this discussion that when you have a private client that is spending all his money in something, they tend to be even more involved in the architectural projects than public money that you don't know where it comes from or who makes decisions. So maybe changing one little unit at a time might make might create a bigger impact um, on maybe the owner or, or who buys or who will live there or who will visit. Always assuming that, of course, architect. Um, uh, we need to think besides what non-architects want, otherwise, of course, they won't ask what we are giving because they don't even know that's a possibility. And that's a bit what I think Philip was also saying, that is, we need to want more than the clients, otherwise, who will want more than the clients? So we need to uh, want to have this kind of discussions with other architects, of course. It would be amazing if <laughs> the rest of the world would be interested in uh, but at least between us, we could discuss deeper meanings of this and other Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Is, is, there, is there anyone in the room that is not an architect? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have two people that are not architects. You see, this is a problem with the society discourse, that architects talk to other architects. <laughs> and we are fine with that, we are used to that, we are comfortable with that, and we can say things among the architects that probably with clients we would never. If there was a client here, we would probably say something very different. Or maybe exactly the same thing, but in a different angle. But I think that the discussion here is not really about society in the end. It's about you know, what we say to each other. And uh, we as architects, maybe because we got used to that, feel comfortable talking about architecture with other architects and about our obsessions as architects and so on and so forth. Um, I thank you, thank you for the great lecture and congratulations for good results. Actually, this is the third time for me to see your lecture. I think the first time was in, I think, uh, five, six years ago in Australia and five months ago in Porto. And uh, this time, third time in 
Okay, it's okay. And uh, I'm wondering how this ego is structured. That means uh, physical structure as a technique. Now I understand you, you avoid to make a lecture for optics, for optics. But still, yeah, I'm, today I noticed, uh, except last, last presentation, last project, you never showed the real uh, section with thickness of slab or walls, always like a single line, the, like a graphic. And you never explain about the structure, and you uh, you explain about the how the wall or a very strange object which is presenting uh, the front. Um, so, but, but uh, in the beginning you started the, 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 the interior project, the presentation project I understand, but now you have many, many projects for the building. So, yeah, actually how do you think of the structure? So, um, the boring answer is that um, in most of our projects, it's actually not within the realm of the achievable to really challenge the structure. In the sense that um, construction in Portugal is extremely, um, let's say, banal and cheap. And so you know from the start that you will do a concrete structure that is, that is disguised in the walls with. Um, yeah, columns are and, and uh, bricks in between them. So essentially, 98% of construction in Portugal is the same structure. It's basically building. And in, in some cases, we decide to expose certain parts of structure, but that's, but let's say, doing a structure that would require a smart engineer is beyond the realm of the, of the possible in most cases. That's the boring answer. Um, the interesting answer <laughs> is that, um, perhaps uh, try, let's say, <clears throat> is that we are perhaps more interested in the structure of what is visible than in the load bearing structure. So we are interested in the ornament, in its capacity, in the capacity of each surface to actually try to address. Um, anyone, and we're interested in the, in what kind of attributes we can get from that more than in, um, let's say, the structure of how to carry slabs. So, <laughs> in a way, um, we're more interested in um, let's let's say. In the Renaissance, in Europe, you would have the tectonic was never really about how to the tectonic of a Renaissance facade was rarely about really how to hold the building. I think Brunelleschi is the, the first one to have said, "Okay, my load-bearing columns need to be a monolithic piece of." I mean, so in this case, I think it's different. But for everything that comes before, it's more about the image that it. Bits and what it says about how it holds and about the actual fact that what you see as a column is holding. I mean, of course, this is, I'm not, I'm not saying anything beyond the obvious, but I think we're more interested in the capacity of what is composed to tell you about the organism than about uh, structure as an engineer would understand. So, you see what I mean? So, that's why we're more interested in, in the column, the central column that is cut, then in the columns that are in the walls that you can see. Because yeah. I, I think I think this has nothing to do with structure, to a certain extent. Like, uh, most of the stone you saw in our projects, it's one and a half to two centimeters thick. It's the idea of stone, more than being stone. And when there's no budget for stone, not a problem, we paint the wall in a color. 
And when we cannot use wood, we paint in yellow, and we find a way to, to do it. So th this is something that comes from many places, not just from architecture, but um, someone that you know, Caesar, works like that. He understands that the visual result of the surface that defines the perimeter of the room is more important than the thickness of such material and its honesty you know, from an intellectual perspective. So, as Ahmed said, because we grew up in a context where we design our own structures, and we have no idea of how to calculate a structure. So that's, that's, that's the condition. Meters. It's always about five meters and it's probably working. And because of the construction business that ends up building the buildings we build, we got used to the idea that this is not where we can, where we can play. Maybe one day if we do something you know, of this nature, at that moment things will change. But if you have out of 50 built works, uh, 35 are 5 by 15 with a structure on the perimeter, you have no need for any structure in between. Maybe those fake columns, they are uh, exactly there because we want to play with structure and we can't. Maybe that's, maybe that's a bit uh, the dilemma. But indeed, what happens is that not just about structure, about every single surface and material, and that's why we normally draw our plans in a single line. I mean, we build cheap, we build bad. We know that, we are aware of that. We respect all the regulation. No bad, I mean, in the sense that it's not a, I mean, we don't build massive concrete walls. We do not have the budget for that. So to us, the fact that it's a plaster wall, brick wall, uh, plasterboard, paper, you know, what matters is that it's white. That matters. The white matters. Everything else is, you know, it's the thickness of the, of the line. So it goes for structure as it goes for, for everything else. Yeah, and maybe just commenting about the last project, actually the last project was the only one where the thickness of the material mattered because we were based on the glass brick, so things need to be 20 centimeters module to fit everything, so in that project the thickness of materials mattered. And now, and, 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 now that contra <coughs> and now that contractor refuses to work with us anymore Good luck. because we challenged a bit the status quo. We asked them to do something else than just a few columns on the perimeter. Now we have more projects in Lisbon and they don't work with us because they say we are complicated. This is, we are really at the bottom of the pyramid. All of these projects are in the bottom budget you can, uh, you can imagine. Is that, uh, is that your behavior related to the strategy of abstraction or something? Sorry? Sorry. Strategy of abstraction. Uh. Abstraction. And, uh, abstraction is, a, is a, a technique, I would say, in this case. Yeah, sometimes you call it the structure and some other function or something element. Mm -hmm. Then you, dis you, you draw the kind of drawings. That, that means you decide the viewpoint. Then every element and composition compressed to the two dimensions sometimes. So in that kind of process, maybe you deal with the kind of elements as a, I don't know, abstraction meaning. Or I mean, and there's a structure that matters a lot to us, that is the spatial structure. For oh. example, when Ahmed shows a house that has a plan with four rooms that are the same in importance. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of mental structure that says that. That matters. So the word structure here means something radically different. When structure comes down to calculating, you know, columns, beams, and so on, I think we learn not to be fascinated about it. Maybe I'll just add one more thing. Uh, a bit also about um, some of these other kind of um, uh, images that we were also doing of the um, detachment of floors and ceilings and whatever happens in between. I also think it's a bit related with this idea of there's a perimeter that is given and we play that has a, um, at least a floor and a ceiling and then we play it inside. Um, because quite often um, it's hard for or there, most of the projects we don't have the chance to also play with the uh, vertical because of rules or because of budget or because of something we just have horizontal surfaces. 
So we really uh, find joy in, in exploring how this vertical or mainly uh, non-horizontal elements uh, help defining the organization, the instead of structure, uh, of those spaces. Okay. Almost time is up, but if you have last questions. Okay. Um, thank you for the great lecture. And I, actually, I was really fascinated to your answer to the question about structure, uh, especially the finishings. So, like you said, like, you know, if you cannot hold stone, then like, you, know, you, you would still be fine with pain. Uh, you know, if you couldn't like, you know, um, hold wood, then like, you know, you're fine with painting yellow. And I wonder like, you know, whether you're fine with uh, fake material, so to speak. Like, uh, let's say like a wooden printed sheet or something like that. So I'm kind of wondering like, you know, this, this is an issue of like, authenticity. Okay, so you said no. Okay. You don't think this. Um, usually clients in Portugal love fake wood. Because it's cheap and then they can wash it with water so it's not a problem. But with that we struggle. Uh, because it's not fake wanting to be fake. It's fake wanting to be real, and that we don't like. When it's assuming that it's fake, it's fake, we like it. When it's really trying to look like real, then we don't like it. So I think that's where we, we define the, the boundary. If, if, if you're going to do plastic wood on the floor, I mean, then just do a good plastic pavement. I mean, why should it look like wood? I know in, in our references we didn't talk about it today, but uh, Venturi Scott Brown is a very important reference for us. And maybe we could have gone in that direction. But I think that the moment you have to have a discussion with a client, and the topic is, I want a wood pavement. Okay, let's make a wood pavement, let's understand you know, how much it costs, what are the technical qualities it has or not, and it's fine. The moment budget is an issue, or a technical reason is a issue, I mean, then let's find another material that solves the same technical problem that is inside the same budget and that gives you other qualities. You know, wood is a fantastic material for sure, but there are others that, that can do it. So it's the same thing. If you cannot afford stone, do paint. Paint is always honest because paint is supposed to just give color to the surface. Paint always works. So find another material that can have that, that quality, but don't do plastic wood or plastic stone or tiles that imitate marble or anything like that. Just one more thing, because I think it's also related with what I was saying, that for us it's not because it's a wood pavement, it's because we want to detach the floor from the walls. Or if we want everything to be one, the first project Philip showed, everything goes white because we don't want, we actually want everything to be merged. So if it's yellow or wood, or if it's marble or blue, they both detach for example, the walls, or they both have a different relation with the, with the other surface. So it's more the contrast or the relation between surfaces, even more than the relation between materials. Okay, <laughs> we want to continue to discuss, but Centennial Hall will be locked down after 20 minutes. So <laughs> let's continue some, some way. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye.